Welcome to all our guests and particularly members, staff and subscribers of the American Sign Museum, the Hagley Museum and Library, Roadside America, Maud Betty's People and the Henry Ford. We are very pleased to be partnering with these organizations and grateful for the cooperation shown by them in promoting this event to their constituencies. In turn, we will be sending along information about programs and events put on by our partners that would be of interest to SCA members. We're happy you took the time out of your autumn evening to watch an SCA presentation. I hope you enjoy the show. And for anybody watching the recording of this episode uh, of the FCA's monthly presentations who's not a member of the SCA, we earnestly ask you to consider joining. Funding for the various activities of the SCA comes almost exclusively from our membership. Just visit our website, www.sca-roadside.org and follow the links. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speakers. Margaret Engel directs the Al Alicia Patterson Journalism Foundation, which gives grants to investigative reporters and photographers in the name of Alicia Patterson, the founder of Newsday. She helped create the Museum of News in Washington, DC, the, New the Museum. As its managing editor, she supervised editorial content in its galleries and its curatorial staff. She and her husband, Bruce Adams wrote three editions of a folder's travel guide to America's baseball parks. She also wrote How to Act Like a Kid, describing the world of young performers for the Disney Company. Chicago Tribune columnist Ellen Warren has been a local, national political, congressional, US Supreme Court, foreign and war correspondent. Among her passions is the 20th century American roadscape, which led her to the photography of John Margulies. This interest prompted her to spend time with Margulies on the road to produce the first in-depth report of his artistic methods and quirky personality. At the end of their successful journey together, looking for iconic buildings of a bygone era, Ellen declared, this has reaffirmed my faith in America. We look forward to listening to Peggy and Ellen as they talk about John Margulies and his seminal work in recording road roadside architecture. Now I'm going to ask uh, Margaret and Ellen to unmute themselves, but I may have to do something here. Hold on a second. Okay, that should work. So Margaret and Ellen, if you can unmute yourself and um, we're ready for your presentation. Terrific. So hello fans of the American Roadside. John Margulies was so ahead of his time. You can call him eccentric, you can call him obsessive, but definitely call him accomplished. He had such a discerning eye, a love of America's main streets and highways and the diners, neon signs, drive-in theaters, mini golf courses, gas stations, maps, and travel brochures. I first met John as a fan from the audience at one of his lectures 30 years ago in Washington, DC. I came up to him afterwards having been so stunned at his knowledge and his breadth of information. And we became friends and I accompanied him on a few of his day trips and drove him to uh, Aquaga Lake, which was this old resort. And any fans of uh, Mrs. Meisel knows that that's been used for that television show in the Catskills. Ellen, who I introduced John to, wrote the definitive profile of John for the Chicago Tribune, detailing his brilliance and his quirky behavior. We're going tonight to see a fraction of his photographs that are housed in the Library of Congress. Thanks to Ford Petrus, who's on this call. He was the curator for 41 years of the library's prints and photographs division, and he was the one who shepherded John's work into the public domain. We have him to thank and the Library of Congress for having all this work, uh, something like 13,400 images available to the public for free online. And about another 1,500 of John's prints and his paper ephemera and artifacts went to the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan, which launched a sensational exhibit of John's work that ran in 2015 and 2016. And I got to spend a week with John there when that opened. 
and it included a full-size root beer stand, John's collection of plastic motel keys, vintage travel scrapbooks that he collected, plus so much more. And John died just six months after the show closed at age 76. And also his vast collection of travel posters are available at the Hagley Museum in Wilmington, Delaware. So let's get started. We're going to start with bars and nightclubs. I'm just going to, we've, we've got IDs on these, and these are ones that you might not have seen of John's because um, his 12 books had many of the images, but there's so many more that are in the uh, Library of Congress that I thought you should see some of the treasures that have not been published in his books. As you know, John was a huge fan of all types of, of architectural styles and he insisted on having nothing around his images when he took pictures of them. So much of what you're seeing now no longer exists. And you'll see many of the images have closed signs on it and they were pretty much closed for good. These former auto showrooms all over America were sensational uh, images that John always went uh, out of his way. Them, the right there. I, Ellen has a story about this one, about how he got this image in Hazard, Kentucky. I know he went out of his way uh, to to get that image early one morning. Let's just keep, whoa. He did a whole series of newspapers, small town newspapers and bottling companies. All right, uh, we'll just go through the Chinese restaurants because he had a whole series on Chinese restaurants dating from the turn of the last century. I love this uranium cafe with chop suey. Okay, before we get to gas stations, I'm going to turn to Ellen and ask her to describe how she traveled with John and what some of his idiosyncras idiosyncrasies were when it came to photographing the roadside. Um, thanks. Thanks very much, Peggy. I spent um, a very, very memorable many hours one day with John, and I've got to say he was absolutely one of a kind and a man of many words. John is, uh, was a, a superly interesting guy and eccentric in the extreme. Uh, he, uh, unasked, he started to tell me about his eccentricities, which he knew were a little odd. He was addicted to chapstick and addicted uh, to breath spray. And he wore always the same style of jacket, sort of a, a safari type jacket with many, many pockets. And he put the chapstick in one pocket where he always knew where it was, breast spray in another. Um, he knew that uh, the best plastic forks were available at Wendy's. And I said, well, 
uh, okay, why are you telling me that? Well, he said, well, somebody has to know. Uh, <laughs> uh, he knew that if he went to dine at one of his, uh, met, his stops were usually a fast food place, that if he went to McDonald's, he would be wiping his hands on his blue jeans because he couldn't stand that they didn't have paper towels. They only had those slow moving uh, heat machines, uh, dryers. And so he wiped his hands on his, his uh, jeans. He, he described this all to me. Uh, he, whenever he traveled, he tried to, he uh, customarily rented the biggest car he could find and his favorite were Cadillacs. And he said, the distance of my head from the top of the car is in dis, dis, <laughs> indirect proportion to my sanity. Um, he offered that he was a picture taking machine. And uh, he said that anyone who passes him is speeding. He was compulsive about going the speed limit. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he was an interesting travel companion, I'll say that. And he, and he said, and boy, was he right. When I travel, it's me, me, me. He said that um, only once, one time in his entire career did he take a companion with him. And, and she lasted five days and then hopped a bus from Centerville, Indiana to get home and away from John. And he tells that story on himself. Anyhow, uh, he's a very exuberant, good-natured guy who uh, absolutely knew what he wanted when he took every picture. Yes, and some other details of his trips. He would have a, a mania for having no visual distraction, and that included people in cars. So he'd sweep trash away from a building. He carried a broom. Uh, he would buy drinks for everybody whose car was parked in front of a diner, for example, that he wanted to photograph. And he would bring a cooler for his film. He never went to digital. He used an old Canon uh, camera, 50 millimeter lens, and he would take his film in a cooler. And he did most of his work um, ahead of time, figuring out which journey he was going to take. And remember, this is all pre-internet. So he had a vast collection of roadmaps and he would take a yellow marker and figure out where he was going to go. And he would carry his essentials, a travel mug, a collapsible bed board, clothes pins, clips, and huge safety pins to keep the drapes closed in the cheapy motels where he stayed. He'd always wanna be on the top floor of two-story motels and definitely away from the elevator. He carried a 20 foot extension cord with him with a night light on one end because the bathroom light often was hooked up to those raspy fans and he couldn't stand the noise. So Ford Petrus said in his wonderful foreword to John's last book, Roadside America, that Toshin printed, that John brought a slingshot made of two rubber bands to zap flies that happened to be in his motel room. So. He, he was extremely eccentric, um, but what a, what a collection of great images. All right, we're going to start now with a new category of gas stations and car washes. Let's see, why is that? Okay. This is the side view of the Delta Queen. Who would ever thought that would have been a good car wash? <laughs> oh, he loved the American roadside, but he didn't own a car. This is a fairly famous one. Peggy, uh, John told me that if you look back at your life and think of the great important moments, those are fine but maybe they're 2% of your life or 1%. And I'm interested in the other 97 or 98%. I think what we do in our everyday experience and with our everyday lives is the most important thing of all. And it's what defines our culture. Well, you know, it, yes, the 98% of your life that you're going to Charlie Price Realtor because he has <laughs> a 
donkey statue. Of course, the larger than life art was wonderful. Um, Americans are so quirky and, and enamored of oversized flamingos, Tyrannosaurus Rex, alligators. Ooh, that, that one's a little not so fabulous. Okay, marine land. John said many times he would photograph something in the morning, and by that afternoon, it was demolished. He was often the last person on the scene before something was uh, going away. And many times he'd come back five and 10 years later and not find anything that he had photographed. Hence the architectural undertaker that he dubbed himself. You know, there's a true American love of having hotels in elephants and uh, crazy larger than life. Um, the, the whole tourist cabin um, era has pretty much vanished from the roadside, but John was there to uh, catalog some of the hotels that were made out of trains and log cabins were always a, a fixture. This is one of the early pictures of Wigwam Village. It's been, it's been renovated since then. One of the things John told me is that, I quote, I wonder if photography is art. I thought that was quite interesting that he would, he, he wasn't really sure if, if what he did was considered art. He didn't know. You know, some of these are just so heartbreaking to see mm -hmm. because you you want them to be open. Um, <laughs> John wrote seriously about architecture. You know, he had um, a degree in journalism and art history from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and in 1962, and then he earned a master's in communication at the Annenberg School, but he started out as an assistant editor at the Architectural Record magazine. And then he moved on to be a program director for the Architectural League of New York. Uh, there, he horrified the community of architecture by mounting a show of the work of Morris Lapidus, best known for the kitschy Fountain Blue and Eden Rock in Miami Beach. And that was just considered, you know, too, too out there. In fact, he had uh, Muzak playing in the background during that show. Um, and then he wrote a, a, an article for Progressive Architecture Magazine, where he praised the Madonna Inn in San Luis Obispo, California. You know, we know it for its honeymoon rooms with Daisy May and caveman themes. But that was just considered not um, in the mainstream of architectural writing. But he started hitting the road early in 1972. And that was the year that architects Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown published Learning from Las Vegas, which gave huge support to the popular architecture that John loved. And on his trips, which often lasted up to eight weeks, he would catalog all of the, the vernacular architecture that he found. He was extremely disciplined about organizing his work. He took um, reporters' notebooks with him and would devote a single page to each of the images he took. And then he cataloged them um, efficiently when he got home into, into notebooks. And Ellen, why don't you tell about his anxiety on the road about his film and his photographs? Oh, um, John was always convinced that something bad would happen to his film and his, his 
elaborate trips and diarying of uh, everything he saw would be for naught. So the day I spent with him, he was he was already getting fidgety because he was going to back back to New York with his 60 film canisters. And he went, he told me, directly from the airport to his printmaker. And the following day, I got a voicemail. It, it, <laughs> he said, this is Johnny. I have all my pictures back and they came out. Hooray. And then he slammed down the phone. Yeah, well, he was absolutely worried about that. Yeah, um, he was. Uh, it, he made that very clear to me. Oh, cool. um, one of the things that John was, uh, and there were many, fanatic about was the uh, the weather as it relates to the light. He said, I'm totally weather dependent. I look at the satellite on the weather channel early in the morning and that determines my itinerary for the day. On a good day, he insisted on getting on the road exactly a half hour after sunrise because he cherishes the early morning light and the lack of traffic. He loved shooting on weekends because there was less traffic, less parked cars, and less activity, which enabled him to take these photos, which he wanted to be iconic. And as we look at them, you'll notice um, uh, the, the streets are immaculate and the lighting is identical. Uh, he told me he was very interested at one time taking a picture of uh, a theater, the Tiff Theater in Tifton, Georgia. Uh, but he passed by it and the light wasn't good. He said <laughs> the building was facing in the wrong direction, so he didn't take the picture. He went back and got it later with his the lighting that he approved of. This one I felt was honest in photography. <laughs> John was very fond of all the muffler men and all of the cows and horses that would be above a, a roof line. You know, we're there's so many images here that I've never seen, Peggy. Thank you for selecting them. Well, I only went through about one fifth of what's in the Library of Congress holdings. Uh, but I did try to pick ones that I hadn't seen from his books. Now, these are in the public domain. Could you actually uh, get a print of these yes. photographs if you wished? Yes. That's fantastic. And John did several books about theaters. This one was on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, and I'm sad to report as we as anyone who's been on there lately it is no more this mm -hmm. wonderful structure but the drive-in theaters really gave america a, a great opportunity with these huge canvases to do something thrilling and startling and a lot of neon and uh, the art deco period was a big time for movie theaters too I loved how they were called auto theaters, as if you didn't understand. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> did did you get a print of this from John, or he told you about it? Oh, no, I own a print, and I, I display it proudly. One of the things John would do whenever I told him I was going somewhere, off the top of his head, he would tell me what unique attractions I needed to catch up to. And he would often give me the route numbers literally off the top of his head. And he just had such a, a photographic memory for what he had shot and what was out in the country. And to his estimation, he traveled 100,000 miles and often went back to some places to see how they were doing years later. But he really had such a, a amazing mind and memory for what he had and what he had collected.
Um, for the story I wrote about John, I talked to Mike Jackson, who was the chief architect with the Preservation Services Division of the Illinois Historic Preservation, Preservation Agency. And uh, Mike pointed out that it was, it's pretty intriguing that Margulies chronicled an automobile landscape without automobiles in them. And as Peggy pointed out, he didn't have a car. He got help from um, the Alicia Patterson Foundation, the Guggenheim Foundation. Um, architect Philip Johnson helped him um, subsidize some of his trips out on the road. There were many years when he didn't have the funds to get out there. He estimated back in the day, it took him about $200 a day to stay on the road. And he was staying at very inexpensive places, but just uh, the film and the gas and the food. Um, and the chapstick. Yes. And the breath, and the breath spray. Um, you know, he had a whole, a whole program of washing the car window. Um, and he had, he was very particular, uh, the car windshield, uh, about the mm. type of paper towels that he used. Um, that should not come as a big surprise from what I've told you. And uh, just for your own shopping pleasure, the, the brand he approved of was Viva. <laughs> uh, one of his first book was on the resorts of the Catskills. He didn't write that book, but he took the photographs for it back mm -hmm. in 1979. And he that's when he first came across Scott's family resort in Aquaga Lake, in, which is in Deposit, New York. And he used to go back there every summer. The family was in its sixth generation. And it was very old fashioned. They had a family talent show. And he loved it. And uh, they, uh, I think, accommodated him every summer, no matter what. And I just checked and it's been going on since 1869, but it was sold last year to Mark Garagos, the famous LA defense attorney. Mm -hmm. um, and it was used in the last four years for the filming of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. When John and I went up to Aquaga Lake, he took me to a nearby ice cream stand that had this Rube Goldberg machine in it that took square quarts of ice cream and then the operator would push a handle down and it would automatically turn them into small squares of ice cream bars. It was this wacky machine that I think that was one of two left in the country. I've always wanted to go back and see if it's still there. So many of John's images have for sale signs or realtor signs in front mm. of it. And here's yet another one. A lot, so many of these pictures were really serendipity, weren't they, Peggy? He just kind of cruised around and and, and yes. parked his car. Yeah, he had no idea, no idea. You know, he he did books on on miniature golf courses too, which the book itself is covered in green astroturf. <laughs> was clever but who would have thought other than john to really okay so we are through our images um and i'm just going to go back so we're on an image when we well, let's see which one we'll stay we'll stay with maybe this one um and i know there i see there are 38 comments in the chat so Brian, I don't know if you need to read them to us or you're going to curate those. Yeah, I will I will go through them with you. We have, oh, we have 38 comments, but we have, <clears throat> not all of them are, are questions. Most of them are, are comments saying how wonderful this presentation is and how much people are enjoying it. So, but we do have some bunch of questions and there will be more that will come as, the, as we go through. Uh, first one, I don't know whether you yourself or Ellen will be able to answer this, but it's Dan Searing 
Dan, if you're uh, still online, unmute yourself, please, and uh, you can ask a question. But his question is, I'd like to hear more about his technique, please. What time of day did he prefer to shoot? Um, as as uh, he told me, he wanted to get out on the road in, in uh, exactly a half hour after sunrise. And that was his favorite, uh, his favorite light to shoot in. Um, I, I didn't get any of the really down and dirty details of his photography because I guess I wasn't an expert. And uh, maybe that was a shortcoming of my reportage. Well, he did, but, he did shoot most of them in 35 millimeter slides with the Canon camera, a 50 millimeter lens, and he used a very slow film, an ASA 25. And he did that to maximize the color saturation. Uh, but he was fussy about the light. He did not like clouds. His best day would be a cloudless sky. No people, no trash, no cars. So, you know, he, his interest was having just the image. Okay, Dan, are you, if you're on, uh, uh, still online, feel free to unmute and uh, perhaps uh, follow up. Um, but we'll uh, that was on. wonderful. Thank you so much. Many of my questions were answered during the presentation and that extra detail that they just gave was terrific. I, I, this has been such a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, a couple more things. Go ahead, Fro go ahead, Ford. Um, well, the, the 35 millimeter Kodachrome. <laughs> um, he was not a fan of that. Uh, and he, um, yes, loved the mornings and the evening with raking light. For the neon signs, of course, he wanted some, a little twilight, but not too much because he wanted to collect the architects, see the sign itself, but also the light. And that was probably one of the most challenging windows for him. Um, and he, you know, he said, I go, he has, he has an image in his mind, I think even before he sees the building, you know, um, and so it, he said, you know, I'm a one shot guy. <laughs> um, uh, I, I get there and, and, you know, if my light is right, um, I'll get it. Some, like uh, Bruce Warren said, was he, he would come back another year if the light wasn't right. And he loved, loved the building enough <laughs> because he wanted to capture that image. These were like his children um, uh, and his enthusiasm for them was just amazing. I mean, and he, you could sit with him if he were with us, you could go through each of these images and he could tell you in detail what the day was like, <laughs> uh, um, you know, how he got there, how he left, what he ate, <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and what was, of course, the main thing, what was special about that particular building and image. Uh, if I may, uh, Peggy, the, the collection at the archive at, at the Library of Congress, we were not able to acquire everything um, as we aspired to. We have, I think there are 11,700 images in the library's archive, all of which are digitized, all of which are public domain. The remainder are at the Henry Ford Museum and I'm not sure if they're digitized or not, or I'm not sure if they're in the public domain. But from the beginning, that was our goal. There also is an ephemera collection given by John with over 3,000 items. And you can go online, and I would ask everyone to, the one, if you write down one thing, write PPOC. You can Google it. That's the Prints and Photographs Online Catalog. And that's your most direct route using any search engine to get to this. You get to there and you just put in John Margulies and it will lead you to the guide records for the ephemera collection or the photograph collection and all over 11,000 images, which are available at different sizes that you can download because part of this was all about access. So someone with a little computer <laughs> or a phone or a small memory can use a small image and someone who wants to use it in a publication 
can use a TIFF file. So there are up to four different sizes of these images, which we were very lucky to scan um, to get to have a special end of the year thing at the library one year uh, when they were looking for large collections that where the information was available, the caption, so to speak. And so that's that was always our goal, but we didn't know how many years it would take to make these available online. And it happened sooner than we thought. But this was in multiple installments, which you can see when you go to the guide record, because every year was a fight to get money to buy, to purchase more of the archive from John and to purchase it with the rights. So it would be available to the American people. Okay, I've talked enough. <laughs> Well, well, thank you, I, thank you very much, Ford. Uh, for, just before we go on, Margaret, Ford, could you just tell the folks at home uh, what, what your connection with John was? I take it you're connected with the Library of Congress. Uh, I worked for the library for 41 years oh. uh, as curator of the architecture, design, and engineering collections. Uh, in the latter years, my title was director of the Center for Architecture, Design, and engineering, which I also created to help make these things available. And I knew about John's work. Uh, it really came into focus. And we had began to have conversations about his archive when he had his exhibit at the National Building Museum on the American High, which featured both his photographs and, and, and things from his ephemera collection. Um, and so the plan was for the library to acquire all the photographs and John would match it with staged gifts of his ephemera collection. And it started out that way. But then at one point we got stuck. We couldn't, for two or three years, we couldn't get the acquisitions money for the next installment. And so, you know, it was, qu it was quite a, quite a struggle, <laughs> but we, we, you know, we pulled through <laughs> and uh, that's why these wonderful things are available. And I think, I think it's thrilling. Uh, I mean, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, it did. Thank you very much for this most interesting. Uh, Margaret, were you going to say something there? Well, one thing that you probably don't know about John, that he had a cameo in Andy Warhol's 1965 film called Camp. And he was an early promoter of Warhol's work. So I've never caught up with that film, but someday I'd like to. <laughs> that would be great. Um, the next question is from Karen Kinnair. She says, are these images published in a book? And I will be, I forgot to mention, but I'll mention it right now, that our speakers tonight did very kindly uh, prepare a book list of John's work and, and maybe some works about John. Uh, and also, Ellen has, uh, as you know, is a journalist for the Chicago Tribune, and she wrote an article, which she has provided as well. So I will be sending that book list and the Chicago Tribune article out to everybody who registered for the show tonight by email. That should come to you sometime later tonight. So you'll have that book list and you'll have the the um, you'll have uh, Ellen's uh, Chicago Tribune article. Um, was there any, anything else you wanted to add on that one, Margaret, about are these images published in a book? Oh, well, the books are, are wonderful. And if you want to buy them inexpensively, if you go to abooks.com, um, they have many of them there. Uh, the, the prime book, it was his last book that Tashin did, which is uh, just a beautiful coffee table size book. And that one is is quite expensive, but um, the others you can acquire and he, for a relatively low sum. Um, and he did, you know, highway books, but he did uh, postcard books as well. Um, and he did post, and he did cookbooks, which he did uh, cookbooks for all 50 states of uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, foods that are popular in all 50 states. And he did uh, those with um, other co-authors too. So uh, he really had a, a wide variety of interests, but he populated all of his books with his collected articles. He collected state tablecloths, uh, state napkins. Uh, in the wonderful exhibit that was at 
um, the Henry Ford, they had an entire wall of his um, beautiful uh, travel pennants. And he had a whole, they had an entire wall of the plastic motel room keys that he collected. <laughs> um, and they just did such an imaginative job with it. So um, I, I, think I was uh, privileged actually to see that. I went to that exhibit at the Henry Ford and I, I echo your sentiment. It was absolutely excellent, especially the pennants. Uh, we have a question from Rachel Ewell who says, what year was, uh, what years were, was he actively taking photos? And I think you did mention that, but maybe you could go over that again. We started in 72 and then the last year he went out was 2005. So that um, his eyesight was failing and, and that was what really kept him from going out after that. But uh, I, I will just give a quick read to some of the books from the book list. Um, Resorts of the Catskills, End of the Road, The Vanishing Highway Architecture in America, the Miniature Golf Book, Ticket to Paradise, America, American Movie Theaters and How We Had Fun. This was one I had never known that he had done. Have Some Sand, The Gritty Side of Love, which are postcards on love and romance. Signs of Our Times on Signs, uh, Palaces of Dreams, movie theater postcards. Another one I didn't know that he did, Dimpled Lunatics, the mad world <laughs> of babyhood. And it's all kind of baby um, paper ephemera. Pump and circumstance, the glory days of the gas station. Home away from home, motels in America. And then he did pump and circumstance, 30 gas station postcards. Hitting the road, the art of the American road map that he did with Douglas A. York Jr. Fun Along the Road, American Tourist Attractions, See the USA, the Art of the American Travel Brochure with Eric Baker, Cooking USA, 50 Favorite Recipes from Across America, Blue Ribbon USA, Prize Winning Recipes, The All-American Christmas Cookbook, another one I didn't know he did, Family Favorites from Every State, and then his last one, Roadside America, Architectural Relics from a Vanishing Past. He also collected what are called Dexter Press photographs. And those were taken between 1935 and 1950. And they were designed, they were mostly black and white and they were designed to be used as photographs. And they feature uh, gas stations, diners and stores so that the diners and stores would buy these photographs. and. I don't think anybody else collected them, but John did. And they're really a wonderful way of seeing what America's commercial landscape looked like in those three decades. Wow, that's uh, just fascinating. And as I said, I will send out that book list so people can look them up and maybe buy them on aid books. I have an interesting question from Grace Wingyon Toy, who asks, uh, did he stay at or patronize the restaurants and so on that were the subjects of his photographs. Occasionally, he was a huge fan of barbecue. So he would look for barbecue, but usually he was in such a hurry, he would often go to McDonald's because he knew they had clean restrooms. Um, but if, if it was a barbecue place or a place he had been to before, like anytime he came to Washington, we always went to the same restaurant, which was called Chris Fields, still going on in Silver Spring, Maryland, great neon sign, a seafood restaurant. He always got the same thing um, every time, uh, this broiled crab dish. And so he was a man of um, specific tastes and constancy. That reminds me, Peggy, that um, he told me whenever he checked into wherever he was sleeping that night, he would totally unmake and then remake the bed to his exacting specifications. And he always insisted that they deliver um, a, well, now it's popular, you know, a, uh, a wide array of pillows so he could choose the one that he felt was most suitable for his needs. <laughs> <laughs> that would be of interesting habits. Uh, we have a, a couple of, actually, you'll get the chat afterwards, uh, Ellen and, and Margaret, but 
And a lot of the comments are people, you, you flash up a picture and they say, I stayed there or I know that place or I ate there or that's a great diner and so on. So you'll see all those. Uh, but we have two comments at least here, one from Stephanie Stuckey and then Jim Foreman. He says he traveled all over the country. Did he have specific places to visit and shoot or he just drive around hoping to find interesting places? In other words, how did he find the places to, to, to photograph? Well, he knew some places because people would tell him. And so he'd have three or four that he definitely wanted to hit, but then he would just take a chance on different routes. And he knew all the blue highways, it seemingly in America. Um, and he, he just had such an incredible eye. I would go with him to antique stores or in, more often antique malls because he was always looking for paper ephemera. And we would look at the exact same booths, look at the stuff, and I wouldn't see anything. And he would find, you know, four treasures that I had overlooked or didn't see. I mean, he really was uh, not only a walking encyclopedia, but he was just so discerning. And he had this sixth sense about uh, routes to be on. Um, he knew how towns developed. He had a huge love for American Midwest uh, courthouses and downtowns. I mean, he wasn't just into glitz and neon. He really took hundreds of photos of these beautifully built American courthouses in small towns and counties around the country. And if you ever, um, any place you've ever lived, you should go on the Library of Congress and see if they have your um, courthouse there that probably has been torn down and modernized. But he had a great reverence for that. Oh, that's, that's it. Go, go ahead, uh, Alan. I was just going to say that on the day I spent with him, I said, well, where are we going, John? He said, we're going east to the lake and turning left. So he really didn't, <laughs> he didn't really have an itinerary at all. And yet uh, he found some treasures and photographed them with uh, just such a brilliance and joy. I mean, it just gave him such delight to come upon these, these treasures. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, here, here's a question from Ian. I, this is a sort of a pretty fundamental question and maybe it'll give some insight into, into John's personality. The question is, what was John's purpose for doing all this? Ellen, he spoke to you about that. Uh, uh, he, was, he, he, he was kind of com compulsive about preserving all, uh, so many of these interesting signs, buildings, restaurants, etc., because they were going, going, gone. And he knew if he didn't do it, that no one would remember or know what America was like in so many particular and, ways. And I think that's also why he, I mean, it so appealed to him that it go to the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. And he really wanted the whole thing to because we would preserve it. He knew that we more likely than anyone else, because we knew how to take care of color film and black and white film. And I mean, that was one of the things that our preservation office was always involved with. And, he, you know, and he visited there and it gave him great comfort that this record of what of this part of America that through his eyes, he the filter, he saw its importance. It was something other people didn't recognize. He dedicated his life to documenting it and he wanted that legacy to be a lasting one. And he told me that his love for the roadside started when he was about eight years old and his parents would put him in the car with his brother and they would be driving, um, but they would go fast towards a destination and he'd see all these wonderful things on the side of the road he would almost memorize what gas stations were there and, and which brands they were and so his parents were asher margulies and he was an executive with macy's and his mother was a painter ethel polachek and so clearly design and and interest in in visual was part of his family life but as soon as he got his own his driver's license he started visiting those roadside attractions and gas stations that he'd seen through the window as a youngster and that 
stuck with him from his very first early passion of looking at these crazy, you know, pull off here and see snakes at the snake area or whatever they would call them. And he would not um, get to stop with his parents because they were on their way. But then he got the luxury of his own car and uh, went on the road and never gave that up. Peggy, he, he, he didn't he he didn't get rich on this on this occupation, did he? No, he, he led lived a pretty frugally. Frugal life. I mean, he lived on air for a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of years. Um, he pieced together uh, freelance writing, books, uh, fellowship grants, the kindness of architects like Philip Johnson. He did a lot of work for the Architectural League of New York. But uh, no, there, you know, we don't support the arts all that wonderfully in America. And he had some very lean years and many years he wanted to be out on the road, but couldn't afford to do it, which is uh, a big sadness. Uh, you know, he probably would have had uh, many, many thousand more images, but at least um, he did get out as much as he did. It was sort of, um, sometimes he would have funds when the books were doing well. And then other times he was always scrambling. Yeah, that, I'm glad that that got brought up because that was actually the next question from Jim Foreman. I assume he spent his own money traveling. Did he have any type of corporate or other supports? I think you've answered that question. He really didn't. Now, Nancy Sturm poses a very practical question. <laughs> On his trips, if the day was rainy, would he sit in his hotel room, scout out what to shoot when the weather cleared, or what did he do when the weather wasn't good? He would well stew. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't shoot that's for sure he was so fussy about his life you know i think he well, would go to the movies sometimes but uh, <laughs> he, he would really it would really set him back he he would tend to go on um times when the tourists wouldn't be out on the road so he didn't usually go in the summers he would go in the spring or the fall and he loved going and out where it was the possible oh. Yeah, he, he loved going out on Saturdays and holidays when the when there were places that tourists wouldn't normally be. So because he had trouble keeping cars away from his objects. Oh, very interesting. He uh, would also uh, shop for his ephemera collection if it was possible, if it was an area that allowed that. And did, uh, Peggy, uh, Ellen, did you ever visit his apartment where everything was? Yes. Two stories hot. Yeah, I mean, I scaled the shelves on a ladder. Yes. Well, I went to both. Of, well, to both of his apartments in New York. The first one on West Seventy Fifth Street, which was mm -hmm. pretty compact, but he had one of those huge um, signs, the red neon signs mm -hmm. with the horse flying, which which gas station was that i should know this but um he had mobile? a mobile he had a full you know 10 foot mobile red neon sign in his in his uh, apartment but he knew where everything was because it wasn't just the paper ephemera and the postcards and the uh, state tablecloths it was it print after print after print and uh, slides he had and, but then when he moved uh to the east side uh, towards the end of his life, he had much more space there, and he had a rolling um, ladder, and he had black notebooks filled. And I'm sure, Ford, you probably have had very few people donate or or have their collections acquired by the Library of Congress that had things in such terrific inventory shape. No, it was that was one of the things that helped me sell it to my bosses. <laughs> mm. um, we have a, a nice message here from, and by the way, there's a ton of very complimentary comments, which you will see. Uh, there's also, people have posted a large number of um, websites and, and links to, uh, to uh, articles of interest of, about John. But uh, Deborah Jane Seltzer uh, posts a very nice comment. Uh, Deborah, if you're online, maybe you could come out, come on and just say it, but I'll start reading it. It says, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting John at a presentation in New York City in 2012. He sort of kind of knew about my website then, and he asked me about 
<clears throat> what came to his mind? Is uh, ask about what what came to his mind? Is that still there? No. Nope. Is this still around? Yes. Recently repainted. On and on. I was glad I could fill him in on the status of stuff at that point and give him immediate answers. I've been through his entire Library of Congress collection and included links to everything at my site for what's there and what's gone, which is, uh, I think, um, quite nice. I mean, in some ways, DJS is our, our, uh, our new Margolis, uh, but um, it's, um, it's a very nice comment. Uh, I have a few more questions here. It's nine o'clock, so we're getting past time, but let's just go from uh, for a few more. Lots of comments. Somebody says cookbooks, <laughs> uh, which I the same thing. Uh, Grace asked the question again. Do you know if Chinese Asian American historical organizations ever worked with him regarding his restaurant pictures? I don't think so. He just took them because they were old um, and most of them were early uses of neon. Okay. All right, Max Mueller from the Hagley Museum uh, makes a comment and the Hagley was one of our partner organizations in this presentation. He says, if you want to learn more about the many fascinating roadside attractions that John visited, Hagley Museum and Library holds a collection of the booklets and takeaways that he acquired during his travel travels across the country. And the Hagley is located in Wilmington, Delaware. I've been there. I went there after the New York City conference this year, and it was uh, it's a very, very good museum and, and highly professional and well organized. So um, you can Google Hagley Museum and uh, have a look at their collection of booklets and takeaways they acquired during his travels. Um, Dean Milano uh, is, uh, asks if he can say something. So, Dean, if you're still online, unmute yourself and let's hear it. Well, I'll try and be quick because you're running out of time, obviously. Uh, just want to say I'm a major fan of John Margola, as always have been uh, for probably 40 years. Joined SCA back around 1980 when I met uh, uh, John Bader. And uh, John and I became good friends uh, and over the years. Uh, but for those of us who would like to own the real buildings, but can't, we build models of them instead. <laughs> and this is my model of a theater. Uh, I have hundreds and hundreds of these models that I've built of gas stations and diners and cabin motels and everything else. It's a really a fun way to, to express your love of the American roadside is building, building the models. So that's, and I've got a website and most of them are on my website. Um, and I'm also a musician and, uh, I wrote a song a few years back called Take the Blue Highway, which talks about getting off the interstates and getting onto the blue highways and finding all this wonderful stuff that's out there. And the song has gotten tons of airplay. It's probably been played in like 50 or 60 countries around the world. Um, Ellen, you may know WXRT, Radio WFMT, WPC. Yeah. It's been yeah, played sure. on all those stations. And a lot of people have gotten back to me and they said, Dean, we took your advice on your song and we have traveled the blue highways. Thank you so much for for suggesting that. So um, that's all I wanted to say, and you can go on from here. <laughs> Thanks very much, Dean. Uh, Lisa Lee asks, uh, Margaret, can you please show the last slide with the info on contacts? And in so in the few minutes that we have left, uh, people can copy that down if they're interested. So there it is there. Now we do have um, a um, another, I've got to get back to him, back to it here. Uh, Bill Dolnick asked, did he have a family? You mentioned his parents, and um, it doesn't sound like he had his own family. Was there any family connection that you know of? Well, he had his brother, Paul, um, and I, I met him a long time ago. I don't know his whereabouts now. I should, but I think one of the um, Melissa Margulies is on the call or was earlier, and she could probably tell us um, what the situation is. Okay, well, if you're still online, then please unmute yourself and, and jump in. Uh, on his slide. father, his grandfather was a famous rabbi, he liked to say, but he'd like, he'd, I don't know if he ever really knew him, <laughs> but he was <laughs> proud that his grandfather was one, uh, quite a distinguished rabbi if, in terms of family. And, and Peggy and Ellen, it was John Margulies, is that isn't that correct with the emphasis yeah. on the first syllable? Yes, yes. For people's information, because that's the sort of thing that gets lost. He was yeah. very much. A, he was very precise about the way his name should be pronounced. 
Yeah. And just about everything else, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, here's a question. We'll just take a couple more here. Dan Searing asks again, uh, did he know Jan and Michael Stern? Jane and Michael Stern. Um, you know, they're all from Connecticut. So, I mean, I, John was born in New Canaan. I don't know whether, whether he knew Jane um, and Michael Stern. I don't, I don't think so. He knew of their books, obviously, but I don't think they had a cross connect connection. My twin and I wrote uh, uh, three books about America, small food companies. And so we worked with Jane and Michael because they were uh, cataloging all the restaurants and we were doing all the small food companies. But uh, I, I just don't know the answer to that. Okay. Uh, I just, I, uh, oh, it's when Bill Swislow just asked the same question. Did John know the Stern? So we got the answer from that. Um, I'm going to just finish off with one more comment from, um, from Deborah Jane Seltzer. <laughs> She's listening, obviously. She goes, ah, shucks. Yes, <laughs> meeting him was one of the high points of my life. I ate up all his books as they were published. My pleasure to be as compulsive or more, if possible, as he was and as quirky. Ha. Huh? So that's great. <laughs> Deborah Jane, maybe it's a, it's a prerequisite of that line of work or that kind of uh, an avocation. Anyways, uh, that's that's pretty much it for the questions and comments. Was there anything else, uh, Margaret or Ellen, that you'd like to say before we sign off? I have a few closing comments as well. I've just, learned a lot tonight. Thank you. Just that he was such a one of a kind person. I I miss him a lot, and he was really special, very different. I I couldn't believe just being a fan that we became such good friends and. Uh, he's he's really missed and he really contributed a lot to America. Well, that's great. So thank you two again for a wonderful presentation. Very most interesting and fascinating about a real icon in American Roseside. Uh, we'd like to let everybody know that we will be giving Ellen a membership uh, in the SCA as, as a small thank you, a token of our appreciation for her work tonight. And um Ellen already, or Margaret already is a member, so we'll extend hers for another another year as a, as a small token of our appreciation. Um, I'd like to remind everybody again uh, about next month when Josh Silber will be speaking about the 20th century architecture of Cuba and those who are working towards its preservation. Wednesday, November 16th at 8 p.m. Eastern. It'll be standard by that time and 7 p.m. Central. SCA members will be receiving the relevant details and registration link by email. Others can register through the website directly. Also, don't forget about the John Margolis signed print online auction, which starts tomorrow. So full details are at the SCA website starting tomorrow. That's sca-roadside.org. And all SCA members will be receiving email tomorrow about how to participate. You must be a uh, member to participate, but that brings a lot of other benefits as well. Um, thank you to all our guests from our partner organizations tonight. We really appreciate the publicity that our partners have given to this presentation. Uh, you can expect an email shortly inviting you to join the SCA if you enjoyed it and to take advantage of all the benefits of membership. And just to also remind you that uh, the tonight's uh, presentation has been recorded and it will be present. It will be uh, posted on the SCA website uh, probably by tomorrow. Our webmasters are incredibly efficient. And so you can watch it again. You can refer it to other uh, friends and people that might be interested. Uh, we had 144 participants watching tonight, which is by far a record for these uh, SCA Zoom meetings. Uh, and I think that is a testament to the quality of the presentation and to the, uh, the great interest people have in John Mar Margulies' work. So with those comments, I will, and we're running a little over time, it's 910. I will thank our speakers again. I will bid everyone good night and I look forward to seeing you all in a month's time. Good night. Good night.